Bonjour tout le monde, good morning everyone, and welcome to this second day of the Conference of Montreal by the International Economic Forum of the Americas. My name is Louis-Nicolas Boulanger, and I'm a partner at the Canadian national law firm McCarty Tetro, and I'm based here in Montreal. Today, I will have the pleasure of hosting this morning's session titled The Future of Green Hydrogen, presented by Hydro-Quebec. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I will moderate this discussion with our four speakers. I will ask three questions and each member of our panel will have an opportunity to provide an answer for a few minutes, two, three minutes each. There will be an opportunity for our audience to ask questions to the panel uh, for about five to 10 minutes at the end of the session if we have enough time. So please, if you have questions, uh, please uh, have them uh, write them in at the appropriate spot on your viewing platform and they will be relayed to me and the members of our panel. Uh, without further ado, let's begin. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, and allow me first to introduce uh, the members of the panel for today's discussion. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, leaders of the uh, green hydrogen industry with us here today, uh, representing several stages of the hydrogen uh, supply chain from manufacturing of equipment to production to fuel supply. We have sort of a broad range, public sector, private sector, so it uh, promises to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, let's start with uh, Mrs. Uh, Michelle Azalbert, and you will allow me to read her bio quickly. Michel Azalbert is the Managing Director of the Green Hydrogen Business Unit at NG. Uh, Michel holds a Computer Science Engineering degree and graduated in Business Administration at HEC. She assumed various responsibilities in the sectors of Treasury, Financing and Risk Management at Elf Aquitaine, Sanofi and then Suez. She became Head of Treasury and Risk Management of the Suez Group in 2005, then held various senior leadership positions at Gasilis and NG. Before being named Managing Director of NG's Green Hydrogen Business Unit, Michel Azalbert was Chief Operating Officer of NG's Global LNG Business Unit. Welcome, Michel. Next is Dr. Christian Mélanger, whose bio is in French, so please use your translation tool uh, if you want to hear it in English. Uh, Christian Mélanger uh, a rejoint l'Institut de recherche Hydro-Québec en 2016. Il est présentement Directeur Recherche, Progrès Stratégique et Transversaux chez Hydro-Québec. À ce titre, il est responsable de la vision technologique d'entreprise en relation avec cette direction. Avant de rejoindre Hydro-Québec, M. Bélanger a travaillé en recherche et développement dans diverses organisations dans le secteur de la chimie, des matériaux et de l'automobile, dont 16 ans en Europe. Il possède une large expérience de la gestion de l'innovation, autant dans le secteur public que le secteur privé. M. Bélanger a reçu son doctorat de l'Université McGill en génie chimique en 1992 et son diplôme d'ingénieur en génie physique de l'École polytechnique de Montréal en 86, et il possède un MBA de l'Université Concordia. Bienvenue, Christian. Simon Moore. Simon Moore is Vice President Investor Relations, Corporate Relations, and Sustainability at Air Products. He is responsible for building and maintaining relationships with investors and analysts through an ongoing dialogue about Air Products' corporate, business, and financial objectives and growth opportunities. He has responsibility for the company's corporate relations organization, including global government relations, community relations, and philanthropy. He also has a leadership responsibility for sustainability at Air Products. Mr. Moore joined Air Products in the 1990 as a merchant gas uh, sales representative in Los Angeles. From 95 and on, he held various positions within the company, and he even relocated to Taiwan in 2004, where uh, he was named uh, Director Fab Development for Electronics and then Global Director uh, Electronics Materials in 2007. He returned to Allentown in 2010 as Director of Investor Relations. He became responsible for corporate relations in 2016 and sustainability in 2020. Mr. Moore holds a degree in mechanical engineering from the Pennsylvania State University and an MBA from Pepperdine University. Welcome, Simon. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Christoph Neuress, Head of Green Hydrogen at Thyssen Group. Uh, Christoph is guiding Thyssen Group's green hydrogen business since the beginning of 2020. He is convinced that industrial scale green hydrogen of multi hundreds of megawatt up to gigawatt scale is the key to transform the energy and chemical industry towards carbon neutrality. Christoph has gained 20 plus years of business experience in the chemical plant engineering industry, five years of which as executive director in Japan, 
12 years in sales and execution of EPC project within Thyssen Krupp's Industrial Solutions Group, and five years in research and development. He gained international business expertise working for more than five years in Asia and more than 15 years in Germany and other European countries. Just taking a bit of a pause here. Now that we know a bit more uh, about our terrific panel, let's jump right into it and allow me to briefly uh, set the table for today's topic, which again is a conversation about the future of green hydrogen. Uh, just for the benefit of the audience, uh, hydrogen has been hailed as a fuel of the future, uh, which could help to end the world's dependence on fossil fuels and aid the transition to net zero emissions. You can use it to fuel cars, planes, perhaps trucks, boats, trains, uh, you know, the image of someone drinking pure water uh, that was generated from its H2 burning uh, vehicle is a powerful image. Uh, there are other uses as well. You can inject it uh, in natural gas pipelines and blend it uh, to use it uh, for the generation of power and heat. It can be mixed with gasoline to improve the performance of cars and reduce emissions control. So the, the, the uses are multiple. But the question is, how can we get it? Uh, hydrogen is an abundant and the most abundant element in our universe, but on Earth, it is scarce uh, and in its pure form. It's mostly found combined uh, with oxygen in the form of water, uh, and it needs to be split into molecules to, 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 be, to be useful. Uh, there are various means of obtaining hydrogen, and green hydrogen is one of those means. Uh, essentially, what we're talking about here today is a hydrogen fuel that is obtained from the electrolysis of water, uh, using electricity that is being generated by low carbon emission sources, such as wind, solar, and whatnot. It should be differentiated from uh, blue hydrogen, which is essentially a hydrogen fuel produced from sources which generate more carbon emissions, but are captured via technology that, that is specific to, to, to carbon capture. And finally, we should also differentiate it from uh, green, uh, sorry, gray, brown, or black hydrogen, which are essentially uh, other means of designated hydrogen fuel, uh, but that are uh, uh, produce a, an increased uh, sort of carbon emission sources. Over recent years, uh, the development of green hydrogen towards widespread usage has undeniably accelerated as governments have increased their decarbonization commitments throughout the world. In a study prepared by McKinsey earlier this year in July, uh, for the benefit of the Hydrogen Council, I'm sure our speakers are, are, are familiar with the study, um, it was indicated that hydrogen pipeline has grown to $500 billion, with close to 360 projects uh, that have been officially announced as, uh, by companies uh, throughout the world. This is almost a double of what we had earlier in the first months of the year. So we can see there's a clearly a, a lot of momentum. And we see it every day, uh, technological announcements, uh, uh, huge projects being announced as well. Uh, Hydro-Quebec, as an example, have a project here in Varennes uh, with ThyssenKrupp, I believe. Uh, NG and Air Products also have uh, huge uh, industrial projects uh, in the pipeline. Uh, so clearly a, a lot of uh, interest from the business side of things. And on the policy side of things as well, uh, things are moving. As an example, Canada uh, has a national hydrogen strategy since December of last year uh, to help them achieve their goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And doing so, Canada joins a long list of countries like France, like Germany, like Norway, as well as the European Union, uh, who all have plans to stimulate the production of hydrogen. So for green hydrogen to meet those lofty expectations, certain challenges need to be solved. And the question here today is, what is the future of green hydrogen? Is the hype justified? Leading us to our first question for this panel, um, and I would like to start with uh, just taking a quick uh, short step back and to take a look back on the recent uh, evolution of hydrogen and green hydrogen. What is your perspective on the progress achieved over the past few years to get where we are today? What have we accomplished exactly? And I would like to start this conversation perhaps with Simon Moore. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today with this distinguished panel to talk about one of the most exciting topics in the world today, which is hydrogen and green hydrogen. So I'm going to step back more than just a year, and I'm just going to talk about hydrogen. I think it's important to recognize that hydrogen has been a key part of the world's economy for decades. Now, we're thinking about using it in very different ways, but Air Products has been the leader in safely producing and distributing hydrogen for 60 years. 
And I think that's really important as we think about going forward, because just like any other form of energy, hydrogen has to be handled very, very safely. And that experience is really, really important. It's also interesting to note that hydrogen, even today, even gray hydrogen is primarily used by the refining industry to clean up transportation fuels. So it's interesting that hydrogen, even today, uh, obviously has very significant environmental benefits. I think we would all say that we have been astounded by how fast the world has moved. Perhaps not fast enough, but if I think about a year or two ago, I think many of us saw this coming. But the way the uh, fundamentally what people want is cleaner forms of energy, lower carbon forms of energy. And the, what's exciting is governments and industries are seeing the role that hydrogen can play to support that need for lower carbon energy. Make no mistake, the world needs a lot of energy going forward and hydrogen has a key role to play. And I think, as you mentioned, you see real action happening. You probably see a few announcements that maybe will or won't happen, but you absolutely see real action happening. You mentioned a few of the projects, and, and I'll be happy to come back to it later, but we're tremendously proud of the $7 billion commitment we made to a, a real game changer for the world project to produce green hydrogen in Saudi Arabia and distribute that around the world to support the de development of the carbon-free hydrogen transportation market. And with that, I'll look forward to coming back and maybe making some more comments on that and pass along to the next guest. Thank you, Simon and Michel. Yes, thank you. And, and also very, very pleased to be with you today on this panel. Um, so really, um, renewable hydrogen uh, is, at the heart, is at the heart of Engie's strategy to accompany its clients and territories on their path uh, to uh, carbon neutrality. And within NG, it's considered really as a missing link huh, to store and to, um, and to unlock, first, first of all, the potential of renewable energy. Why so? To store large quantity of renewable energy over long period and also to transport a large quantity of renewable energy over long distances from the production center to the consumption centers. So we have uh, been involved in the hydrogen business for many years now, same as uh, air product, uh, more than 25 years in, uh, in research. And, uh, and a pioneer also in the creation of the business unit dedicated uh, to the development of, uh, of a renewable hydrogen business uh, created in 2018. And the purpose is to develop uh, industrial scale project at global level. And we considered at that time that the environment was favorable. Why so? Because we saw at that time a customer already engaged in greener pathways. We saw also some countries at that time, already three, more than three years ago, uh, engage uh, into hydrogen, developing the hydrogen economy and, and giving support, case of Australia, for instance. And also, uh, we observed also uh, the strong decrease of uh, renewable prices, which um, over the, the past decades, uh, um, um, the costs were reduced by uh, more than 80% and more to come in the future also. And today, uh, renewables are competitive without subsidies. So for sure, we are facing today an unprecedented momentum for hydrogen. It is recognized uh, that it is necessary uh, to achieve the climate goals. And also both the private and public sectors uh, believe that hydrogen should be developed now. And, uh, and the support is coming uh, right now. Uh, you already mentioned uh, Louis-Nicolas, many countries are uh, giving support to, to hydrogen. This is a case of uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, Canada, uh, of Germany, France, Portugal, Italy, uh, Chile, Korea, so plenty of countries. And as you mentioned also, plenty of projects are currently developed, uh, more than uh, 359 right now, uh, for a total investment uh, amount of uh, 500 billion of dollars to be invested uh, by uh, 2030. And in between, since uh, Febr February 2021, sorry, uh, more than 100 projects, in total 130 projects have been announced. So you see the, the speed at which uh, the hydrogen economy is, uh, is developing. So within NG, uh, we have uh, uh, our contribution to the development of this ambition, and we target uh, by 2030 to have 4 gigawatts of installed capacity. Uh, and, uh, and we have concrete projects, and right now more than 70 projects, and a big bunch of them of industrial scale. And, uh, and our strategy is really to, to deliver, 
to deliver first concrete milestones. So it's beyond talking, it's make it happen. And uh, what do we have today in terms of concrete uh, concrete project uh, in construction or, uh, or partially delivered? Uh, I, I will mention some of them. Among others, uh, the project we have with Yara in Australia uh, to produce green ammonia. And, uh, and also the project we have with Anglo-American in South Africa uh, to build the first hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen propelled uh, mining truck. And also the project we have in the south of France, southeast, uh, to, uh, to develop a network of refueling stations uh, supplied with renewable hydrogen. So what is the goal of these first steps is to demonstrate the technical and financial feasibility of this project in order to de-risk them and then to be able uh, for the next following steps uh, to develop uh, larger scale projects. Thank you, Michel. Very, very interesting. Uh, Christian Bélanger? Well, first of all, thank, thank you very much for the invitation to participate to this panel. Um, as uh, Simon mentioned, it, I think uh, hydrogen is not new. Uh, uh, at Hydro-Quebec, in fact, we've been looking at this for, uh, for many years, over 20 years, uh, with uh, sometimes very low activities, which was the case, like, for example, four or five years ago. Uh, but for five years ago, we decided, in fact, to look back to these topics more seriously. We did an in-depth, uh, in fact, analysis of the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, <laughs> let's say the, uh, the, the the, uh, the the importance of the of the of the of the, of the uh, hydrogen economy and uh, we uh, decided to invest more uh, uh, massively into this uh, this uh, sector of activities and as uh, mr boulanger mentioned it in fact um, recently uh, hydro quebec has announced the uh, construction of one of the world's largest renewable hydrogen and oxygen production facility with the 88, uh, in fact, megawatt uh, electrolyzer leveraging um, Quebec's green electricity to to supply a biofuel plant in the uh, uh, Montreal greater uh, area. And um, on top of this, in fact, uh, in terms of R and D, we we have also uh, intensify our activities uh, quite a lot over the I would say the last uh, few years. We've invested uh, strongly into new labs and new, new activities, and uh, we are in fact looking at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the the overall in fact uh, e-fuel uh, supply chain, which include uh, hydrogen, and 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 why a utility would be interested in such a topic where uh, you're used to sell electricity is because uh, if you want to let's say decarbonize your economy, uh, there's a uh, Many, many activities into the economies that you won't be able to decarbonize if you don't have any, uh, let's say, clean or green uh, fuel, uh, which can be hydrogen or uh, barrio fuel or e-fuel. And this is a, a, a sector of activities where, in fact, we're looking at the very seriously. And in fact, we're very proud of uh, it's over the last four years. In fact, things have been very fast, you know. Uh, are we, uh, you know, with the uh, recent announcement that there's other other projects that are being discussed uh, internally with with other partners that uh, may maybe announce in the next uh, few years. Thanks. Thank you very much for for those comments, uh, Christian. Uh, Christophe Norris from uh, Tissenko. Yeah, uh, thank you, Louis. Thanks a lot for the uh, nice um, introduction and uh, thank you for being here on the panel today. Yeah, um, I have the uh, chance to represent ThyssenKrupp here in this panel. And ThyssenKrupp has, in, in principle, two roles in the whole hydrogen story. On the one hand, ThyssenKrupp is uh, one of the uh, big steel producing companies, uh, number one in, um, in, the, uh, in Europe. And on the other hand, ThyssenKrupp has um, uh, quite some established plant EPC business um, um, we have expertise in building chemical plants for now 100 years. We just celebrated this year or 100 years anniversary. And one part of this is electrolysis plants. So we have also ex expertise, significant expertise in the electrolysis business for the petrochemical industry and, and by that also for green hydrogen. And now having these two things in one corporation as to support, it's a huge chance to cooperate and to develop that. On the one hand, you have this great story about transforming the steel, um, the gray steel to the green steel, uh, giving green steel for the car industry to pro produce green cars, uh, which is one of the best business cases for green hydrogen as per the um, 
uh, Hygiene Council McKinsey report, as you already mentioned, that one which was issued beginning of this year. Um, on, on the other hand, we, we can also utilize our own technology to test that and to develop it together. And that is what we have done in the last years. If you look um, backwards, um, we have started 2016 with a remarkable project here in Germany, um, which is called Carbon to Chem. And one part of that project, which was started 2016, um, which was significantly funded by a German government and other partners. Um, so we, we, we have installed there uh, several processes on the one hand to produce green hydrogen, on the other hand also to utilize carbon from the steel industry to make green chemicals. And that is one of the very interesting projects which we have established. And um, in addition to that, we are working together inside Tyson Group to develop a huge project here in Germany, close to the disintegrated steel site here in Germany, um, to manufacture green hydrogen there and to deliver green hydrogen for the green steel production, uh, which is called hydroxy. So if you look back now, so we had utilized last year to transfer our electrolysis expertise from the petrochemical industry, from industrial expertise into the field of green hydrogen. Uh, we have now established uh, uh, industrial scale, scalable technology with a 20 megawatt standard module size. And with that, we have the key for um, building projects, industrial scale projects worldwide. And I think that is really uh, what, we, what we have established over the last years. And if you look just over the last two years, we were capable to support the development of significant projects. So we, we, uh, we have done the first phase for, for Hydro for the 88 megawatt project, which was published beginning of this year. We, we, have, uh, we, we have done a project or we are under execution of projects for CFI in the US uh, to provide green hydrogen for green ammonia. And uh, there are further projects um, like the one um, uh, NEOM project where NEOM has decided uh, to select Hissenkrupp technology for green hydrogen production and KSA for the NEOM project. So I think these are really a, a selection of published uh, projects showing that the whole um, hydrogen um, transformation has now reached a scale, uh, not anymore uh, one megawatt or two megawatt scale, but now we are at hundreds of megawatt scale projects. And if you look back now, I think this is really a significant achievement, which done, was done by a lot of all the partners participating, technology providers, investors, uh, the chemical industry, utility companies, I think all those companies have done really a significant job over the last years. And now I think we, we are really in the real push towards uh, uh, green transformation. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Christoph. And it's, uh, this is very interesting. And I think we can see it from each of, of your company's presentation. The magnitude of the investments that we're talking about now, we're clearly at a stage where there is momentum and it's not just about pilot plants or you know just tentative steps. We're really at a stage where, you know, Companies are looking at real industrial uh, projects of uh, uh, of a scale that I guess we could, wouldn't have seen just a few years back. So it's uh, it's quite telling uh, hearing each one of you uh, discussing your your perspective on the past. Uh, let, let's move on to the next topic, which is the promises of green hydrogen and what are the most uh, realistic but also promising applications. Uh, I, I think each one of you has alluded to some, but I'd like to get the, your perspective on what is uh, the, the most promising applications of green hydrogen and what is its true place in the uh, global energy supply. And for this question, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Christian Bélanger from Hydro Quebec. Thank you. So, uh, in terms of application, um... Uh, we we usually divide them in may, maybe in, let's say in two types, uh, which are uh, we call mobility and stationary application. Uh, what what I mean by stationary application, it's mostly industrial application, and I think it has been mentioned by the other uh, member of the panels. Uh, and if you look at the uh, hydrogen consumption here today, uh, for example, in Quebec. It's, it's mostly, in fact, an industrial application like steel or uh, oil uh, re refining. So basically, that's, that's the, the, the market. And uh, in, in terms of, uh, let's say, mobility, uh, it is a, a lot more uh, challenging because of the complexity of the infrastructure that you need to put in place. Uh, 
uh, and you need a refueling station, whether uh, it's produced uh, locally by, uh, let's say, small small production unit, or whether you you produce it at at, at a hubs and 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 you uh, distribute it to your refueling station. It, this involves a lot more of the uh, stakeholders. So uh, I would say, on the short term, uh, stationary application or industrial application are a lot easier. I would say to um, to 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 tackle, even though uh, you, you face uh, cost issues or uh, comp- competitiveness in terms of, of cost. So that, that, that's uh, more or less uh, uh, how, how we, uh, we see it here today. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Uh, Christophe, you care to uh, talk about your views uh, of hydrogen's true place in the global energy supply? Yes, thank you. So first of all, I would like to to raise this um, business case about the green steel. I think that is really one of the best cases where we want to transform the industry, moving that industry to green steel. And um, as said, only here, I think with our Duisburg side of ThyssenKrupp, um, there's a chance to install more than five gigawatt of green hydrogen, for sure not in, in Duisburg, but somewhere we have to install that to transform that, um, say, the, the biggest uh, integrated steel factory inside, inside Europe. So I think that is already one of the um, key examples from our colleagues. Um, but as, as said, we, we are really thinking industrial scale. Um, we, we, are, we are not so much um, looking into the scale of small remote um, petrol station um, linked uh, production sites um, um, which were investigated in the past so we always focus in the industrial scale applications and there are quite some reasons for that so first reason for that is because many many um, industrial applications need already using gray hydrogen um, for example for 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 gray ammonia as one example it's many applications in refineries and so there's an easy, very easy uh, way to um, exchange that and, and utilize green hydrogen to decarbonize those processes. Um, the second thing is we want to come down with cost of green hydrogen. And for that, we need, um, we need uh, at the end somehow power to X. Uh, we, we have power to X application typically and those processes to make them uh, um, in, in a very um, low cost area, we need scale, especially on the downstream. If you come with the green hydrogen to the downstream, like green ammonia or refineries, especially the green ammonia, green ammonia uh, needs scale to come down with cost. And that is one of the uh, key items. The, the third item to further come down with cost and have um, green hydrogen at a, at a reasonable level is even the, elect, the elect, uh, electrolyzer section of the green hydrogen uh, production is a modular-based or, or a numbering up process style, um, we, we can reduce specific costs by increasing the overall size of the overall um, signal project. So even if it's a, it's a modular-based process and we have a numbering up, we can reduce specific costs for such project if we increase the overall scale of that project. Yeah, and third item or fourth item, better to say, is really uh, many, many cases require transport. For example, in Europe, we have not sufficient renewable energy. So we have to transport energy either from KSA, from Middle East, North Africa, from Australia, from South America. And um, so we would have cases going from green hydrogen to um, chemicals, green chemicals. And those we have to transport and transportation chains need scale. So all this is a matter of scale. We, we need industrial scale to have competitive green hydrogen. And therefore, we 150% trust in industrial scale applications as a first driver for the green transformation. And I'm sure after a certain time, if we have re-established a green hydrogen market, also other sectors might follow. And maybe even also in mobility, we have more applications, not only in the heavy duty, but maybe also in a normal car sector, um, green hydrogen might be utilized in the, in the future as all the costs will come down. And we, we really uh, see that that's a key area. And for example, there's now a, a very interesting funding program uh, established in Germany to kick off such industrial scale green hydrogen markets. So it's called H2 Global. Uh, ThyssenKrupp is also one of the foundation members of that. And um, the idea of this is 
to establish at the beginning this uh, market by um, establishing tenders for where you can um, bid as a green hydrogen PPA, so maybe a production somewhere in Middle East, North Africa. And on the other hand, in Germany, companies can also bid to um, get a green hydrogen. And we expect that there will still be a gap between both the uh, selling and the uh, procuring of that. And that such gap will be covered by the German government, for sure, only for a limited size of market. But we see this is a really interesting instrument to kick off this industrial scale um, uh, movement. And, and I think this is something very interesting and it will push further the market. So I think uh, those industrial applications are the right um, way to go forward. And this will be the first mover for the green transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. Uh, Michel Azalbert, what do you and what does NG view as uh, the most promising and realistic applications of uh, green hydrogen? Um, what uh, we can say um, is that, first of all, um, hydrogen is a very versatile product. And it is at the, at the crossroad of the, uh, many sectors. So we mentioned it's a feedstock for the industry, unlike for the production of ammonia, methanol, uh, the refineries. It's also an, 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 um, um, an energy source for the production of uh, green steel. It's also a, a, a fuel. It's also a storage mean. It's also a way to transport uh, renewables over long distances as a gas. Uh, so you see that there are many applications. And the fact that there are many applications uh, creates a lot of opportunity uh, to uh, drive the total cost of the solution down. Why so? As Christophe mentioned, as it, it's all about scale. In order to achieve uh, cost reduction, economies of scale, you have to develop very large infrastructure. And you have to combine different pieces of a solution. It's about renewable, it's about storage, it's about electrolyzer, it's about uh, des desalination of water. It's about uh, pipes, it's about uh, uh, tanks, so, so many, many pieces of the value chain that each of them can deliver value and on, from, from which you can extract value. And so, as an example, okay, for sure you produce hydrogen and you can produce hydrogen for the industry as a feedstock, but you need also to store in order to provide a flat profile. The fact that you store uh, hydrogen allows you also to provide flexibility service to the grid in case the system, the energy system, needs a solution to, uh, to stabilize uh, the energy systems. This is an example. But at the same time also, you can combine the hydrogen with CO2 and then produce e-fuel and then address different markets where the benchmark, I would say the threshold in terms of economicity is higher compared to the, 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 the benchmark, the threshold for the industry. So at the end of the day, by pooling also different type of uses, you can optimize the total cost of the solution And especially in the early years, you can also minimize the requirement uh, to uh, public support. So it's all about that today to achieve all, of, all about that. And what we do believe um, within NG is that today the, the model is not a dedicated, a dedicated plant for one single use, a type of use. It's really uh, a very large infrastructure uh, providing uh, a full, uh, full uh, range of uh, very different solutions and from which you can extract value, uh, be it on the production side or on the demand side, in order uh, to, uh, to, uh, to deliver the return on, of, of investment you expect uh, in your infrastructure, because it's a, it's a, lot, of, uh, a lot of money to invest in the development of this uh, very large infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Michel Azalbert. Uh, Simon Moore, uh, closing remarks on the topic of the promises of uh, green hydrogen. What does Air Product think about all of this? Well, I think our uh, panelists have indicated how incredibly huge this market opportunity is. I think each of them spoke to some different market opportunities. And to be clear, Air Products is very focused in all of those areas. But because we didn't spend much time in talking about mobility, I'd like to make a few comments mm -hmm. on mobility. And in our view, and perhaps we have a little bit of a different uh, difference of agreement among the panel, is we do see a very exciting opportunity that is here now in mobility. But it is not for all vehicles. It's not for all mobility. Fundamentally, the bigger the vehicle is, the longer the distance is, the heavier the load, that's where hydrogen shines relative to battery-powered electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. 
So in our view, passenger vehicles likely in most cases are to become battery vehicles, maybe at some point become hydrogen. But when you look at the long haul trucking market, you look at the bus market, we see those as today be markets that are excited about the opportunity to reduce their carbon footprint to zero by converting to hydrogen. And it's also more amenable because in a lot of those markets, you don't need to build out a huge refueling infrastructure. If you think about most of the city buses in the world, they come back to one or two depots during the day, during the night, at the end of the night. So you can build the hydrogen refueling infrastructure. And again, I mentioned our NEON project that we're very, very proud of, you know, $7 billion that we and our partners have committed to this project. And we're going to have carbon-free hydrogen for the mobility market in 2025. What's also exciting about it, as we often say, is the vehicle doesn't know whether the hydrogen is gray, blue, or green. Mm -hmm. We're obviously doing this because we want to move to green hydrogen. But in the meantime, you can see different cities and organizations around the world beginning to adopt running trial programs. And these are the behaviors you'd have to see before you saw full-scale adoption. And what's exciting is that can go on today, even if it's gray hydrogen, and then be ready to drop in the green hydrogen in 2025. So again, we're excited about all of the markets the other panelists talked about and look forward to playing a key role. But at this point, we really do see the heavy transportation market being one of the uh, most exciting markets. And again, we'll have the green hydrogen to support that market in 2025. Thank you, Simon. I'm looking forward to my first uh, flight on a hydrogen fuel fueled plane that, that happens someday. <laughs> uh, since uh, since uh, time is, uh, is, is running out a bit, I'd like to transition to our third topic of the day, which is a discussion about the challenges that are facing uh, the green hydrogen industry. What are these challenges to the full realization of the potential of green hydrogen? Um, you know, I think some of you alluded to it, Simon, you just talked about, uh, you know, battery vehicle versus hydrogen fuel vehicle. That's an example of a competing source of energy. Lots of people have lots of great ideas as to how we can uh, move towards a decarbonized economy. Um, I'd like to hear uh, this panel on, on, on your prospects of what are the key challenges and, and perhaps some, uh, some ways to overcome these challenges. So, uh, Michelle Azalba, if you don't mind uh, taking a first crack at this. Thank you. For us, the, 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 the main challenge today is really to, to, um, to address the, 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 the question of the cost. And to, and to activate the demand. Uh, today, the, the hydrogen is uh, most, more costly compared to the alternative uh, greener solution. And even if you include a reasonable CO2 tax, it's still, uh, it is still more expensive. So the question, who is able to afford for this uh, price differential? At the end of the day, the customer are potentially able uh, to pay a certain portion of the premium, but not the whole, uh, the whole premium. And even if you design very, very large scale uh, installation, you still have a price gap to fill. So what we do believe is that, um, that the main stimulus um, plans announced recently are really going into the right direction, uh, for sure. And they all also, all, all of them recognize the full potential of hydrogen. But also beyond subsidies, what we think we need, it's, uh, it's also regulation. Regulation in order to accelerate the scale up, really accelerate it at the right scale. Uh, we need also mechanism such as, uh, for instance, contract for difference uh, to uh, bridge the gap uh, during the, the first years uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 to activate the market. And we also, we think that we need also specific targets, uh, short and medium term targets um, for the industry and transportation sector in order really to activate the demand. And also potentially a stimulus, um, uh, fun, um, stimulus uh, plan in order to, uh, to, uh, to via public tenders, as you mentioned also for, um, for Germany, in order really to, 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 activate, uh, to activate the market. And also beyond, uh, beyond uh, regulation, beyond subsidies, we also think we need market instrument also. The market is able also uh, to support the development of hydrogen. So I think the ability to trade a uh, guarantee of origin uh, for sure will help based on hydrogen. CO2 tax also, that uh, really represents uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the carbon footprint. 
And also, potentially, as I already mentioned, with regard to storage, capacity mechanism, remuneration mechanism uh, for a solution providing flexibility to the grid and a specific location in the world, they are looking for this kind of solution, uh, like California, for instance, but also the south of Australia. And also, um, and we think also we need harmonization uh, within markets in order to have a fair uh, level of playing field. Uh, so this is on the, on the demand side. On the technology uh, side, we think that it's uh, progressively, progressively we will be able uh, to, to move uh, all these projects at the uh, gigawatt scale um, and be able to, uh, to efficiently uh, integrate all the pieces of the, of the value chain, as I mentioned before. And also to integrate, also an important part, to integrate also these facilities with the, um, with the industrial processes, downstream processes to produce, for instance, ammonia, uh, also in the refinery. So it's where also you need to invest a bit, a bit of time and money in order to optimize the solution and also to extract the flexibility from the downstream asset in order to optimize the total cost of the solution. So really, at the end of the day, we think this is, will be manageable. Uh, and lastly, uh, with regard to the challenge, the cost uh, challenge, with beyond the fact that we think uh, we need instruments uh, or mechanism to uh, to activate the demand, um, we think also uh, with regard to the challenge of cost, and especially for electrolyzer we mentioned, but also it is the case also for um, for the renewable part. But it's more specifically for electrolyzer, we think that um, the electrolyzer producer will be able to really drive the cost of the solution down, provided that that they have orders. So to, to have orders, we need, as developers, to take investment decision. And to take investment decision, we need to align all the pieces, the technical part, but also the financial part, and to have a, um, a workable business case whereby we can count on the, on the instrument I mentioned, where we can bridge uh, most of the competitiveness gas in order to take this investment decision with a bit of risk also, because we will, be, we will have risk also on these assets, but really be able to align all of that. So um, to conclude, going back to the, to, the, um, to the framework, we think that it's important to align all the pieces and uh, quickly in order that we have visibility on the mechanism we can uh, activate or count uh, in order to take this investment decision. Thank you, uh, Michel. Uh, Simon Moore, you also agree that cost is one of the key challenges mm. uh, with regards to green hydrogen? Well, I have to say that because we have one of our key suppliers for the NEON project on the call with us today. So, of course, we do. But let me take this in a little bit of a different direction. I, I agree with what everybody has said, but, but I, we actually think one of the biggest challenges is, quite frankly, the size of the market. We talked about this in the last question. It is so huge. When we're talking about changing the fundamental way the world gets its energy, the need, the, the number of people to build projects, the capital required, we think that's one of the biggest challenges. And one of the biggest risks is people not moving quickly enough, which is why we're very excited about our bold moves to go forward. And because of that, I'd like to suggest, I appreciate today's topic is green hydrogen, but I would like to encourage us to think of zero carbon hydrogen as really the right way to frame this. Because I think that if we try to make all of this move in the so-called green hydrogen only, I just think there's not enough capacity in the system in the world to make this happen. So I think so-called blue hydrogen and two months ago, we announced a very large project uh, in Alberta, which is blue hydrogen, but net zero. So let me say that again. It's blue hydrogen sourced from natural gas, but net zero. So at the end of the day, we are producing hydrogen for our pipeline network. We're going to liquefy some of that hydrogen for the transportation market. And it is it got a net zero uh, impact. And so in our view, you're going to need to have uh, a couple of different colors of the rainbow, certainly blue hydrogen going forward, proving you can do that in a net zero way to complement the growth of the green hydrogen. Because again, as we talked in the last question, the market opportunity is so big, we need to move boldly and we, and we need lower and lower carbon, zero carbon, regardless of what color it is. Christoph Neuris from ThyssenKrupp, uh, your views on the challenges to the full realization of the potential of green hydrogen, please. Yeah, let me first react a little bit to some statements. And uh, I think um, 
Yes, for sure. At the moment, I think hydrogen uh, costs are still um, higher than gray hydrogen. That is clear. Everybody knows that. But um, I, I cannot go into details, but I just pick up now one example um, from our colleagues from, from Steel. And say, if you take this example, um, you want to you, they have the chance to buy a normal car from BMW or Volkswagen, whatever, or a green car. Yeah. You know? I think there's a significant chance that people will pay a significant premium to get a green car. Now, I just selected last time my new car, and I was shocked how much I have to pay for this special kind of tires yeah, or the special leather seating there. It was huge. And I think my colleagues told me, if you want to choose in the future the option, you get a green car made by Tristan Crop Green Steel, hey, this is by far less than this special seating option there. So I'm sure people will pay for that. They will pay for that premium. And I think companies, I think some of you, like like here, Heidel Quebec, like NG, and also especially our products, they are the first mover in the market. You will have the chance to get that premium paid, and people will pay for that. I think we are now really in a new, in a new phase. People... Uh, see that that they have to do something. It's not anymore the young people um, or the, the 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 academics. It's the whole society now really sees that item and they will pay for it. But nevertheless, I don't want to uh, sneak out here about the uh, the cost topic. Uh, but I just let me make one item from our perspective clear. So the overall cost is two things. Uh, it's for sure it's capex and opex at the one hand, and in most projects. OPEX is the most significant part of the whole thing. So what is the challenge for the green transformation is we need lots, massive amounts of green and cheap renewable power. That is the number one issue we have. Yeah? And we have to get the proper utilization of that. We have to get rid of regulation, which says that maximum hours you can utilize it is like 5,000 hours because it kills your business case. Or it has a chance to kill your business case. So we have to work on that one. That is really, I think, one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, for the green transformation. Regarding CapEx cost, uh, for sure, we are committed to come down with cost. We are working very hard on that. I can tell you the last 50 years, we are developing electrolysis plants for big customers uh, the, the chemical industry representatives worldwide and uh, also electrolysis for petrochemical uh, processes, they utilize a huge of amount of power. And if I look back, we had every three years in that market an improvement in technology to come down voltage by voltage every three years. So that is a normal procedure. And this market is by far bigger. So there's even more push, more commitment of the technology uh, providers to come down with uh, capex costs, and just to make one example, so we have um, we, we are working was announced beginning of this year on a huge R and D project to come up with a new technology, new AWE, new alkaline water electro electrolysis technology to further cut costs, and we want to have that in place 2025. Um, and we want to have a five gigawatt installation capacity for manufacturer in place in 2025. Yeah. We have already now one gigawatt supply chain. Um, we, are, we are further improving step by step here, further um, introducing new machines to come down with all the costs. Um, but I think we have really a significant commitment there, significant business plan to invest in that. And I think um, that, that is really our commitment to come down with all the costs and we will provide it. But I think if I look on the overall size of projects, um, all which are announced, um, I'm not sure whether those capacities which are announced, manufacturing capacities, are sufficient for the overall market. So I think it's really something hand in hand of project developer, industry to invest, as well as technology companies to have the investments to scale up the overall production. Because now it's really also a little bit the, the part of the game uh, who's doing first investment, yeah? the, the manufacturer or the, the industry. Yeah. So th those are the two items. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, Christophe Mélanger from Hydro-Quebec. Well, I think uh, most of everything uh, has been said, but uh, I'd like to come back. Well, cost is, is for sure an, an issue. 
Uh, but there's there's other uh, element in the equation. We've mentioned the uh, CO2 taxes that also can uh, influence, in fact, uh, let's say the, the speed at which uh, hydrogen will, uh, let's say, uh, uh, get into the, the market. But uh, I'd like to give uh, a, another, uh, let's say, a utility perspective uh, related to, uh, to, 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 to the cost. Um, uh, and Simon mentioned it, in fact, uh, the, what, what we're facing today is, is um, we are, we're expecting uh, a, a huge increase in terms of uh, green uh, energy uh, demands. And um, you can invest that green energy into, let's say, uh, green hydrogen, but there's, uh, it's competing with, with other applications. Uh, Simon mentioned, let's say, EV, uh, EV uh, cars, which are for, for a, a small, small vehicle. And in fact, uh, today, when we, uh, we uh, choose to, um, let's say, respond to, to a market, we have as a utility taken into account the fact that uh, uh, investing in an EV car is, is probably is, is a lot more efficient that's it, than investing in e-fuel if you look to the overall uh, supply chain of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, green, green fuel. So that, that's the challenge we're facing in terms of utility today. Is there is demand is, is stronger than what we can, we can supply. We will need to build, uh, let's say, new uh, green energy supply, but this takes time. Uh, and that, that's one of the challenges we face. So, thank you very much, uh, Christian Mélanger. Uh, so, so for sure, I understand challenges, but I can still see the the, the bullishness uh, that from from the members of this panel that uh, that you know now is the moment to to strike and uh, and keep pushing this industry forward. Uh, listen, folks, this is most of the time that we had for today. Uh, I'd like to offer the opportunity to our panel for closing remarks, perhaps three seconds or, or a bit more, but uh, for each uh, to close this conversation. Uh, Christoph Norris from uh, Thyssen Group, you want to provide a closing statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as I said, we, we are we are seeing now this huge development and project size. So I'm always using the word that we, we are seeing a, a tsunami of opportunities. I think this is a great chance. We have to keep sp speed here on all sides because we are part of a big uh, green transformation. I think it's the first phase of a significant industrial revolution we are in. I think we can all be proud of that and we are really doing something good for the future. And yeah, I think it's great to work in that field and let's continue your hand in hand to transform the industry. Thank you. Christian Bilagi from uh, Hydro Quebec. Yeah, so I mean, uh, hydrogen is there to, to stay. I believe we're going to, uh, to invest uh, uh, into this, this field. But as I just mentioned, uh, as a utility, we have to balance it with, with other demands in terms of, of energy and it's going to be part of our portfolio for the future. Simon Moore from Air Products. Yeah, as I said, we're incredibly excited about the opportunity to build on our decades of hydrogen experience and really play a leading role helping uh, the world's energy transition. The major projects we've announced, uh, other projects that we have under development, uh, really come together and, and help make Air Products a really, really exciting place to be. And we're honored to be part of this energy transition for the world. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. And finally, Michelle Salva from NG. Thank you. Um, maybe three, three, three main words. Um, I, I think um, it's uh, it's really uh, Im impressive to say uh, to to see today that uh, um, it's um, now fully shared and recognized that hydrogen has a has a role to play in the energy transition. So I think it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, what now it's important to 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 do all together is to act, to act now and uh, and that scale quickly. Uh, quickly, uh, why so? Because we need to build today the infrastructure that we need tomorrow, and uh, and time is of essence. Well, thank you very much, Michel, for those words, and thank you very much to each member of this panel: Christophe Moires from uh, Thyssen Group, Simon Moore from Air Products, Christian Bélanger from Hydro Quebec, and again Michel Zalbert from uh, NG. Thank you for your time and for your insight. Very interesting topic and conversation. Thank you as well to the International Economic Forum of the Americas for the opportunity to speak. And uh, that's it. Have a good day.